Hi, my name is Aaron Lacey. I'm the co-chair of the higher education practice at Thompson Coburn LLP, and you are listening to Discrimination Based on Pregnancy or Marital Status, which is the fourth in our four-part session uh, covering the new Title IX rule. Thompson Coburn, if you don't know us, is a, uh, a large law firm. We have offices around the country, and we have a higher education practice, which means we have a group of attorneys who spend all or most of their time serving institutions of higher education. We do a lot of different things for institutions, litigation, transactional work, uh, but among the services we provide is a lot of regulatory counsel, including with regard to uh, discrimination law. And so uh, Title IX is, as you would expect, one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, if you don't already know, Title IX is the uh, federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex uh, in programs and activities uh, offered by institutions of higher education in the United States, or at least those that participate in the federal financial aid programs. Um, there is a new Title IX rule that takes effect August 1st of 2024. We're recording this four-part series in late July of 2024. So for us, it takes effect in a few days out. When you're watching this video, it may already have taken effect. And this is the, the newest version of a rule that was promulgated first under the Trump administration. And that even came on the heels of a lot of sub-regulatory guidance and discussion uh, beginning with the Obama administration. So the federal government has been thinking about Title IX quite a bit over the last decade. And in particular, how institutions of higher education manage allegations of sexual misconduct on campus. This training series, we would describe as a foundational training series. So in the four parts, uh, this being again, the fourth session of four, what we're really trying to do is talk about the new rule, um, the critical components of the new rule, uh, and also walk through sort of where there might be uh, uh, choices or opportunities for institutions to, to take different paths as they come into compliance. Um, we consider this foundational training uh, meaningful for anyone who's interested in this new rule, but particularly for Title IX coordinators, uh, investigators, adjudicators, and others who will be assisting in the administration of the Title IX rule on their institution's campus. Um, if you are interested in going back and looking at our 2020 Title IX training series, which breaks down uh, what at as of today is the existing rule, soon to be changed. Um, you can do that, and here's a link at the bottom of your screen. I'll also take this opportunity to note that throughout this presentation, you will see uh, linked information, and the slides for this presentation are available on our Higher Education Resources page. I'll get to that in a few minutes. There's a QR code you can scan if you want to go there, um, in addition to lots of other materials that we make available for institutions of higher education. But you can find these videos and all of the actual slides there on that website, and we would be delighted for for you to download those and to click on those links and uh, gain access to the underlying information. In fact, I'll just say now, institutions are welcome to use these videos and this foundational training at their discretion, uh, and they are also welcome to use those slides at their discretion. This is why we made this training publicly available. It sits out on YouTube uh, and our firm's website. This is why we made the 2020 training available. We're you know, making this content uh, easily accessible uh, and free for those of you who are trying to come into compliance with this rule, because we understand there's a lot of challenge there, and uh, we hope that you will find it helpful. Now, I do want to highlight, um, we're also expecting to release a series probably of two or three best practices videos, where we're going to delve into sort of best practices around investigations and adjudications, and we'll talk more about uh, how you can go into, um, you know, managing questions of credibility or evidence, things like that, that are sticky wickets, right? So this four-part series is really Really focused on getting you up to speed on the rule. The best practices series will get more into some of those challenging issues that arise in the actual practice of an investigation or an adjudication. We'll also note that in addition to uh, this foundational type training that we're offering here, and uh, we think the best practices videos will be helpful, folks are going to need to have some type of custom training. And, and the reason for that is you've got to have some training for your employees and the other folks on your campus um, that's specifically about your policy and what your policy requires. And obviously, that's not what this foundational training does. Um, this is about the rule that applies to everyone. It's not specifically about the policy that you're going to have on your campus. 
I will note that Thompson Coburn uh, makes uh, custom training available. We've also developed model policies. We revise policies for folks. Uh, we pretty much provide assistance with all aspects of Title IX for institutions. So if you are interested in discussing custom training, we certainly would be delighted to help you out with that. Or if you'd like uh, to talk to us about our model policy or a policy revision, anything along those lines. If you'd like to do that, you can contact uh, anyone who's in this session. I've included the uh, contact information for, for me and for Scott here on the slide. And again, you can scan that QR code and that'll take you to our higher ed, higher ed resources page where you can find contact information again for all the folks in the presentation, including Leah uh, and Stephanie. Uh, today, I mentioned several times, this is the fourth of our four. We've covered an introduction to the 2024 Title IX rule, complaints of sex discrimination, complaints of sex-based harassment involving students as a party. Uh, and now today we're going to talk about pregnancy and related conditions, which may um, catch some people a little by surprise, because this seems like a very sort of unique or niche concept within the larger Title IX discussion. But our feeling was um, that, particularly in the new regulatory framework represented by this new rule, that these questions around pregnancy and related conditions were, um, there are a number of new concepts and rules that were quite different and that are very important. And we also sense a real focus on these issues by this administration. So, so our feeling was it was absolutely appropriate to create a, a particular session just on this topic. Um, you're going to be hearing from the same four presenters today that have been involved in the whole presentation series or the whole four-part series, and that's Scott Goldschmidt, uh, uh, my colleague and partner, as well as our two uh, excellent attorneys and associates, Leah and Stephanie. Scott, Leah and Stephanie all do a tremendous amount of Title IX work with institutions and have for many years. It's a considerable focus of their practice, and I uh, will just say I'm personally very grateful that they're here uh, at our firm and available to work with institutions and to help them understand this rule. Um, here's our syllabus for today. Uh, we're going to start with Scott, who's going to walk us through uh, a focus on pregnancy and sort of highlight this concept that I was just referring to, which is that this rule and this administration seems to really um, draw out and spend more time on this topic than some of the prior guidance and rules that we've seen. Uh, and then Stephanie's going to work through student requirements. Uh, and finally, Leah's going to round out employee requirements. Again, we think this is a really important topic, which is why we created an entire session just on this topic. That all having been said, it will probably be the shortest of the four sessions. And by the way, if this is the fourth that you're listening to and you've made it all the way through the series, congratulations, because that's we know that's a lot to get through. And we're, we're grateful that you joined us for the whole thing. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Scott. Scott, take us away. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate the introduction. And let me just add, too, um, we thought this session would be helpful in particular because it's a little different than the other ones we've covered, right? Of course, you could have discrimination based off of pregnancy and pregnancy-related conditions, but also there's a lot of concepts in the rule, um, both uh, within the, the 106.40 context, but also later in the rule that really get at accommodations that are required and kind of how you have to treat a student that that gives notice of, of these conditions, the, the pregnancy or related conditions. So we just thought it's, it's a little different enough to not try and uh, stick it in other part of the presentation. And we also, uh, as Aaron mentioned, wanted to, to highlight it because it is a focus of um, of this administration and has been consistently kind of on the on the, the minds of OCR and those enforcing these rules um, for some time. Uh, but let's have a little history. Um, so this, this did not come out of nowhere, right? So other laws, other guidance has come uh, down the pike that have addressed pregnancy and related conditions in the past. Um, hopefully this is all a review slide for everyone, um, but both Title VII and the Pregnancy Discrimination Act prohibit discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. That should all be part of employ, uh, your employment processes and, and standards and things already kind of in your institution. Um, more recently, the Equal Opportunity Employment Con um, Commission issued guidance in 2015, which reinforced the prohibition on discrimination that we talked about on that basis of current pregnancy, past pregnancy, potential or intended pregnancy and medical conditions related to pregnancy. And finally, also just worth noting the Affordable Care Act, which amends the FLSA, requires employers to provide reasonable break times, a private place other than a bathroom for covered employees who are breastfeeding to express milk one year after the child's birth. So as you can see, the, the, the concepts have been there for some time and they've slowly been expanding, covering more things and covering more important topics.
um, but which gets us to, to this rule. And this rule continues that expansion, um, continues. To, so this rule specifically addresses sex discrimination, right? And those those temporary conditions by considering this rule of context, adding clarifications. In particular, um, and as, as we'll discuss, first uh, addressing students and then employees, the, the rule kind of takes two uh, different approaches in two different places with respect to, to pregnancy. So we also want to make sure that people are aware that there is a separate section of the rule related to, to employees. And for both students and employees, the rule, the general overarching um, thrust of the rule is that schools may not adopt a policy, practice, or procedure concerning a student or employee's current potential or past parental, merit, family, or marital status that treats students or employees differently on the basis of sex. And so finally, um, what do we mean when we talk about pregnancy or related conditions? And this goes both for the student and employee section. It means pregnancy, childbirth, termination of pregnancy or lactation, medical conditions related to pregnancy, childbirth, termination, or pregnancy or lactation, or recovery from pregnancy, childbirth, termination, or pregnancy, lactation, or related medical conditions. So it's not just um, pregnancy, right? Just making sure that that when people are understanding these requirements and your obligations, it, it, it's, it's broader than that and encompasses all of these related conditions. All right. So uh, Stephanie, student requirements. Yes, thanks, Erin. Um, as Scott just mentioned, there are uh, both student requirements and employee requirements within the rule, and we're going to just spend some time right now going through those student requirements. Uh, so also, as Scott mentioned, there is throughout this rule non-discrimination, and that is true in the pregnancy context as well. So a school must not adopt or implement any policy practice or procedure concerning a student's current potential or past parental family or marital status that treats students differently on the basis of sex. And while I know I just read that slowly and you just heard it again from Scott, it's a really important note to reiterate that the rule strictly prohibits discrimination um, based on pregnancy and related conditions. Additionally, a school must not discriminate in its education program or activity against any student based on the student's current potential or past pregnancy or related conditions. So that's, you know, saying the same thing there. Again, really hitting home that idea that there is uh, no discrimination that would be tolerated based on these conditions. Um, just as a note, a school does not engage in discrimination when it allows a student based on pregnancy or related conditions to voluntarily participate in a separate program or activity, provided that it's a comparable program or, or activity. Uh, this likely isn't gonna come, come up very much in the higher education context, but if it's something that does apply to you and your school, it's something to just be aware of. So looking at what a school's obligations are to respond to a notice of pregnancy. So when a student, um, or a person who has a legal right to act on behalf of the student, so if that person is a minor, um, informs any employee of the student's pregnancy or related conditions, the employee must promptly provide the contact information of the Title IX coordinator and inform the person, inform the student that, or the legal representative, that the Title IX coordinator can uh, coordinate specific actions to prevent sex discrimination and ensure the students equal access to the school's education program or activity. And that's a long way to say that the school must inform the person who is making the report that there is the, a Title IX coordinator, they must provide the contact information for that person, and then they must provide them with information on what this rule is saying and what the obligations are of the school to respond. Hey, uh, this. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, this is interesting. I and we saw this in state law even prior to this 2024 rule taking effect, where sometimes there were provisions. New York's a good example, where um they have sort of their own state version of Title IX, right? And they said we employees, if they receive certain notification of 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 an allegation of sexual misconduct, they have to be ready to respond and and tell the individual making the report X, Y, and Z. 
And so what it means, I guess, as a practical matter, I mean, and here's my question for you. You know, this seems to just suggest that any employee who is informed uh, by the student, right, of, of their pregnancy related condition has to be ready to sort of take this action. So I, I guess that means, right, that employees throughout an institution are going to have to be trained on this requirement and maybe provided. I know in New York, for example, some schools would provide employees with little laminated cards that said, you know, if someone reports something, you this is what you should tell them. You can keep this in your wallet or on your desk. But, but am I right that fundamentally institutions are going to have to be prepared to train employees so they will understand that this and and other obligations under this new rule exist and be ready to to take action if in this case for example someone reports this kind of information to them yeah absolutely Aaron and I think Leah's going to touch on this too in a little bit but it's such an important point uh and one that I think is uh, very noteworthy is that the rule does have training requirements for employees. Um, and while some states may already be doing that training, there are some places that you may not be training your employees on uh, what the policies are or how to respond in these situations. And uh, that is something that everyone is going to have to adjust to and uh, implement within their own schools. And, and I'll just ask one follow-up question. I'm, I apologize in advance to Leah because I may be stealing her thunder, but does the rule draw any distinction based on type of employee? Are we literally mean every employee of a university? So that could be facilities, maintenance, you name it. Yeah, so um, Leah will be touching on this a little bit more in detail later on, <laughs> but um, but yes, to short answer of your, to your question, Aaron, is that every employee is going to be need, needed to be trained in some capacity. Uh, there are differences for different employees, but every employee will have to receive at least some training. Got it. And apologies again to Leah for, for jumping ahead. No, and Aaron, it's too, I'll just add that this is an important point for um, for your uh, the Title IX training, just, just because now there is a requirement for all employees to to disclose or provide information of about the certain conduct to the Title IX coordinator or the Title IX coordinator's information. So this this training piece is not just specific to employment and, and no. could be folded into that overall employee training that occurs um, that uh, that is now required. Yep. And and if folks, by the way, have not watched session one of this series, we talk a little more about training obligations in session mm -hmm. one. I encourage you to go back and uh, and watch that because it's an important component of the new rule. Stephanie, my apologies for the interruption. No, thanks, Aaron. That was all uh, very important and good to go over. And uh, you'll hear a little bit more about it later on in the presentation as well. Uh, so going back to the notice, though, the notice does not need to be provided if the employee reasonably believes the Title IX coordinator has been notified. So if there's belief that the Title IX coordinator already knows about uh, the pregnancy or pregnancy-related conditions, of a student, then the employee that the student notified uh, does not need to provide the notice that's required. There's also a responsibility to provide information. And uh, again, when a student informs a school of the student's pregnancy or related condition, the school must provide information about a following um, list of items. These include reasonable modifications, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, those are accommodations that can be given to a student, voluntary access to separate and comparable portions of program or, or activity, voluntary leaves of absence, lactation space, the school's limitations on requesting supporting documentation and certifications, the school's obligation to treat pregnancy and related conditions in the same manner as other temporary medical conditions and prohibited disclosures of uh, personally identifiable information. So that's things like social security number and date of birth and uh, that type of information. The school's notice of non-discrimination must also be provided. So um, going back to what we just talked about a couple slides ago, again, this prohibition on discrimination based on pregnancy and related conditions is something that the rule continues to focus on. And there's even a requirement that 
the school's notice of non-discrimination must also be provided to the student making this report. Okay, so moving to reasonable modifications. So reasonable modifications must be provided to a student uh, if they're needed to prevent sex discrimination and ensure equal access to the school's education program or activity. Each reasonable modification must be based on the student's individualized needs. So an individualized assessment must go in to every uh, request for reasonable uh, modifications or an assessment of whether or not reasonable modifications are needed. Uh, and the school must consult with the student. So in looking at the, this overview, you may already be familiar with this type of um, accommodation request as it's similar to things that are seen in the employment context as well, um, but this is applying specifically to students. And, and I'll just offer, just as we advise folks in the context of employment or in context of student accommodation requests under the ADA, um, it's it's obviously critically important to engage in this conversation, but also please document it, right? Because the only way you can establish that you have fulfilled the law is if you are documenting that you went through this individualized process. Absolutely. That's such an important thing uh, to make sure that it's documented. So that way, if anybody comes back later and questions it, you know that that documentation exists. A modification that would fundamentally alter the nature of a school's education program or activity is not a reasonable modification. Um, the, school, the student has discretion to accept or decline each reasonable modification offered by the school. But if a student accepts a school's offered reasonable modification, the school must implement it. So there's no taking back a reasonable modification that's been offered and accepted by a student. So on your screen, you'll see some examples of reasonable modifications. Um, to go over a few that are uh, worth just pointing out and highlighting, um, reasonable modifications can be breaks during class to attend to related health needs. Um, they can also be changes in schedule or course sequence. Um, they can be things that are seemingly small, like carrying or keeping water nearby um, or counseling. And some of these things you may already be allowing students to do or working with students, but um, they're just important to review as these examples are all part of the rule and they're laid out explicitly there. Yeah. And I'll, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, Stephanie, and I'm interested in what you and Scott and Leah, did. I know you all spent a lot of time working in discrimination law context in addition, you know, among other things with the ADA. And it seems like in a lot of respects, this is similar, but that might in a sense almost be dangerous because um, it's not exactly like an ADA analysis, a reasonable accommodation analysis. And so folks who may have familiarity with that framework, again, while they're similar, I would think still need to be very careful and understand that this is not the same thing, that there are a number of um, differences and nuances here. And you really have to take the time, even though it feels familiar, to make sure that you're, you know, to the extent you're implementing this process, that you're paying attention to these rules specifically. Is that fair? Do you all agree? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think just in the phrasing and how things are worded um, in Title IX versus other laws that may have similar procedures is something that stands out to me. Um, for instance, these reasonable modifications, looking at this alone, it, you're looking at mod modifying something that is already in existence rather than accommodating it. So there are um, a number of differences between uh, Title IX and other laws that may require accommodations in the employment context and being aware and knowledgeable of the Title IX specific requirements is certainly important. Yeah, great point. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, the school must allow the student to voluntarily access any separate and comparable portion of the school's education program or activity. So 
This likely, again, won't come up very much in the uh, context of higher education, but if your school does offer a separate program um, that's comparable and um, you must allow a student to voluntarily access that program, but really focus on the fact that it has to be voluntary. You cannot require a pregnant student to do that. So turning to voluntary leaves of absence, a school must allow a student to take a voluntary leave of absence to cover at a minimum what is medically necessary. And medically necessary is something that would be determined by a student's doctor. Uh, additionally, the leave of absence has to be the longest leave that would be available to that student under any other policy. And when a student returns um, back, back to school, back to the classroom, the student must be reinstated to the academic status and as practicable to the extracurricular status that the student held when the voluntary leave began. So what that means is that when a student comes back, they have to come back into the same status that they left. Um, this I think will occur more in terms of academics, but it could also um, apply to extracurriculars as well if there are um, sort of promotions or way to progress within uh, extracurriculars that may arise there too. Um, but a student cannot be penalized for taking a leave of absence due to pregnancy or related conditions. And when they come back, they really, that that status is protected. And Stephanie too, let me let me just add that this, uh, the, the language here I think is really important to, to draw attention to and might be easier said than done the the and we took the the language here as practicable <clears throat> directly from the regulations and just want to point out for schools that that as practicable um, modifier applies to extracurricular activities meaning as as you said to the extent that someone uh, can maybe won't be able to be placed on the same team or things like that an extra activity it's only as practicable but that modifier is not the same is not there for academic status and so this hopefully is it will, will not come up uh, or not be an issue, but certainly could be um, for things like clinicals and, and other um, activities where returning someone to the same academic status, even if that's the intent and that's the the the, the desire of the school, might might not be possible in a certain way. So schools are going to really have to think about how to um, how to provide or how to enforce and and comply with this particular provision. Yeah, Scott, it, it's so interesting you brought that up because I remember, you know, several years ago when when there was some updated guidance uh, during the Obama administration that tracked this idea similarly. And it was this clinical idea in particular was a great challenge for a lot of nursing schools and medical schools because you'd have someone who went out on a leave of absence and either they were about to start or were already in the midst of uh, a, a clinical placement that might be highly regarded or unique or particularly uh, uh, convenient for them, but for a lot of reasons was sort of a favored clinical opportunity. And when the person came back, say in three or four months, that clinical opportunity wasn't available and it might not be available again for, for several months. And so there was sort of this question of, well, how, how do you manage that situation? I, I'm not, I'm not sure there's a perfect answer to that question, but you know, I think you rightly raise just highlight for folks that there's there's no modifier here and there really is an expectation that schools will presumably do everything that they possibly can to comply with this provision and to the extent it may be impossible i think that's going to be something schools are going to be wrestling with moving right along thanks aaron uh, lactation space is another area of the rule that I think deserves some special attention um, because this is something that is going to take a little bit of extra thought or effort from a school because a school must ensure that a student can access a lactation space and that space has requirements. It must be a clean space other than a bathroom. It has to be private and shielded from view. It has to be free from intrusion from others. And it um, 
it has to be used, well, and it may be used by a student for expressing breast milk or breastfeeding as needed. But, you know, really that's what the, the purpose of the space is gonna be. So um, all of those requirements have to be fulfilled when thinking about what space on campus may be used for a lactation space. So supporting documentation is something that I think we often get questions about um, when it comes to pregnant students. And a school cannot require documentation unless the documentation is necessary and reasonable for the school to determine the reasonable modifications to make or whether to take additional specific actions, such as granting a voluntary leave of absence. So, Generally speaking, uh, supporting documentation cannot be required. But if you're looking to implement certain reasonable modifications or a student is requesting a leave of absence, that's when that documentation can be requested and a student may be required to provide the information. So examples of situations when requiring uh, supporting documentation is not necessary and reasonable um, include some of the following. Um, when, a when the student's need for a specific action is obvious, such as when a student who is pregnant needs a bigger uniform, when the student has previously provided the recipient um, in the school with sufficient supporting documentation, when the reasonable modification because of pregnancy or related conditions at issue is allowing a student to carry keep water nearby and drink, use a bigger desk, sit or stand, take breaks to eat or drink or use a restroom. Um, when the student has lactation needs or when the specific action is available to students for reasons other than pregnancy or related conditions, without submitting supporting documentation. So you'll see a couple times throughout the language of the rule in relation to pregnancy that it, the pregnancy um, requirements are actually looking often to what is required if the student wasn't pregnant. And if the student wasn't pregnant, would that student need documentation to do whatever was um, you know, being requested or needed? And that's often a way that that the rule has um, kind of distinguished what's needed for pregnancy um, and when it's not. So pregnancy or relating conditions must be treated in the same man manner and under the same policies as any other temporary medical condition. This requirement is with respect to any medical or hospital benefit, service, plan, or policy the school administers, operates, offers, or participates in with respect to students admitted to the school's education program or activity. So there may be other contexts. Again, this is another one of those kind of similar situations where it's looking between pregnant students and then students that aren't pregnant where the pregnant students must be treated in the same manner in a similar way as any other student that would have a temporary disability. And generally speaking, a school can't require a certification to participate in a program unless that certi certification is required for all students. So again, same thing here. Are the pregnant students being treated differently than every other student? If there's no requirement for every other student, then there cannot be a requirement for a pregnant student. That's generally speaking. However, the rule does carve out a few areas where a certification may be required. And this is um, when a specific level of physical ability is necessary for participation in a class, program, or extracurricular activity, or a certification is required for all students participating in the class. Um, again, looking at what those uh, similarities are between pregnant students and not pregnant students. And um, it cannot be used as a basis for discrimination. Again, looking at that very strict prohibition on discrimination against pregnant students. All right. 
Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for going through all that. A lot to digest there. And uh, just to round out our, our presentation here and, and move on to this last foreshadowed section. And Leah, again, apologies for stealing any thunder you may have here. Uh, we'll we'll turn it over to Leah to talk about employee uh, requirements. Thanks, Aaron. I'm happy to share any thunder with you. Um, <laughs> so yes, we're going to go into the employee requirements. And I do want to preface this by saying uh, um, many of these requirements are going to be similar to what you just heard from Stephanie uh, about the student requirements. We really wanted to make this uh, these slides and this presentation for you so that you could look at one or either on their own so you can use it as a reference for later. Um, so we are going to be a little bit repetitive, but we hope it's a useful repetitiveness as we go through these. <clears throat> So just like with students, and as we said at the beginning, schools cannot adopt or implement any policy, practice, or procedure, or take any employment action on the basis of sex. Um, and that includes the current, potential, or past parental, family, or marital status of an employee or applicant for employment, which treats them differently. So um, we're kind of looking at two categories here, that, that like I said, that parental, family, or marital status, um, and then, or you can also not um, implement any policy procedure or practice that's based on whether the employee or applicant for employment is the head of a household or principal wage earner um, in that employee's family. So your non-discrimination, these are your non-discrimination statements that you want to have everywhere. I want to see them all over your website, um, but this is another one to add to it is that the school cannot discriminate against any employee or applicant on the basis of a current potential or past pregnancy or related conditions. Again, this is what Stephanie went through with students. Um, so we have that kind of head of household, the family status, marital status, and then we have our pregnancy and related conditions that are included there as well. Schools must treat pregnancy and related conditions just like any other temporary medical conditions for all job related purposes. This includes um, commencement durations and extensions of leave, uh, payment of disability income, accrual of seniority and other benefits, and reinstatement to um, their status and any other fringe benefits or other benefits offered to your employees by virtue of their employment with uh, your school, all of those have to be treated um, or pregnancy and related conditions must be treated as temporary medical conditions for the purposes of those benefits. And this includes voluntary leaves of absence. So if your school does not maintain a leave policy, I would reckon to say that most of you do, but if it does not, um, or if there, this is probably more likely, if there is the case of an employee with insufficient leave or has not accrued enough time to qualify for leave under your policies, the school has to treat pregnancy or related conditions as a justification for voluntary leave of absence without pay for a reasonable period of time. Um, reasonable, we see it all the time in the law and people always ask us, what does that mean? What is reasonable? It doesn't say, and it never says, it's always just reasonable. Um, and I think it's gonna depend on the facts and circumstances. And I know that's what you always hear from your attorneys, but um, it's going to depend on what the uh, medical condition is that we're looking at. Um, were there complications? You know, A C-section may be treated differently um, than a non-C-section birth. It kind of is going to depend on the specific circumstances as to what is reasonable, but you have to treat that pregnancy or related condition um, as a justification for a voluntary unpaid leave of absence. Then at the conclusion of that leave, the employee must be restate, reinstated to the status they held when the leave began, leave began or to a comparable position. This means that they cannot have a decrease in the rate of compensation or loss of promotional opportunities or any other right or privilege of employment. Um, again, I think as Scott was saying and Aaron was saying, this is a lot easier said than done in a lot of ways. Um, it's easy to put on paper that we're going to reinstate them to the same or comparable position. Um, it can be a little bit more difficult in practice, but this is something to be aware of, that when you bring an employee back from this kind of leave, um, it's expected that they come back to the same or comparable position. And so you'll want to consult with uh, your HR department and probably your legal counsel to determine what would count um, as the same or comparable position if that position no longer exists. Hey, Leah, one thing I just want to note on that with the context of employees in that it's slightly different than students is that there are federal laws and other laws that actually provide more similar language for employees than in the student context. So while I agree, um, reinstating employees is something that definitely takes consideration and thought. 
Uh, you likely may be already thinking about reinstating employees from leave based on other laws um, and policies that may be in existence already. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in the employee Title IX context um, that we're kind of talking about here, make sure that you're coordinating with your HR departments that are handling a lot of these issues day in and day out and make sure that you're on the same page. You don't want to be working in silos to where no one knows what the other one is doing um, and making sure that uh, you're complying with not only Title IX, but other laws out there. That's a great point, Stephanie. Um, another kind of uh, overlapping requirement that we have seen not only in Title IX, but also in other state laws recently is the uh, provision of a lactation space and time um, to express breast milk. So Title IX provides that school must provide reasonable break time for an employee to express breast milk or breastfeed as needed. Um, and the school must ensure that an employee can access a lactation space that has those same requirements as um, under the student uh, section here. So clean space, it cannot be a bathroom. It has to be private and shielded from view, free from intrusion, and it's a place that is intended for use uh, by a student for expressing, uh, by, a, by an employee for expressing breast milk or breastfeeding as needed. Um, and a lot of our schools, we see them having de uh, dedicated lactation rooms or spaces, which are absolutely wonderful. Um, they can be difficult to come by uh, depending on your school and the last time you did a renovation, do you have room for a dedicated room that's there all the time, 24 seven? Um, as long as the space that you provide meets these requirements, it doesn't have to be a dedicated room. That's ideal, that's wonderful, um, but sometimes it's just not feasible. So these are your kind of minimum requirements. We love to see a room that um, has a thing on the door that says it's, uh, you know, like a mother's room. Um, but if you can't swing it, uh, these are your minimum requirements. But by the way, Leah, just, I mean, this may be obvious to folks, but just to be clear, um, you can use the same space for students and employees. I mean, the requirements are the same. So as long as it's satisfying these requirements, fair to say that either students or employees could could access the space and you'd be complying with the law as long as you're hitting these requirements. Absolutely. I think that that's great. The only thing with that is that um, if you have a lot of students and employees using it, you may run out of you know, time or um, you, know, you want to make sure that they can access it, obviously, individually, that they have an individual space that is free from intrusion from others, um, including in the case of students, their teachers or teachers, their students. Um, so that might be something that you run into. But of course, if you don't have many people using it, that is a great way uh, to kind of use the same space for, for both categories. And and I assume, too, I mean, if you're a a you know, giant university with tens of thousands of, of students and employees, you will probably need several spaces. If you're a very small institution, you you may only need one, but presumably you've got to have space that's sufficient to, to you know, afford this opportunity to however many people on campus require the opportunity. Yeah, you don't want to put any barriers in place here, right? So right. if you're a very sprawling campus, you want to make sure that these are spread out so that if you have a student that only um, has classes on the eastern corner of your giant campus, you want to make sure that there's a lactation space over there for them to use. Yeah. It needs to be available to them and reasonably accessible um, for them to get to. So um, yeah, definitely. The bigger your campus, the bigger your student population, the more lactation spaces you're going to want to provide. So let's talk a little bit about pre-employment inquiries. This is an area that is definitely unique to the employment context, so we didn't discuss it with the students. Um, schools cannot make pre-employment inquiries as to the marital status of an applicant for employment, which is a very interesting uh, new requirement uh, that I thought was just, just really interesting here. So uh, that includes whether the applicant is a miss or misses. So you want to make sure on all of your applications for employment that you don't have that little drop-down box that says, um, are you miss or misses? Um, you can um, do that uh, in, in other ways um, if you don't require them to fill it out. I think that's okay. Uh, if you do require them, that is uh, going to run afoul here. Um, and then same here, the school may ask an applicant for employment to self-identify their sex, but only if the question is asked of all applicants and it's not used as a basis for discrimination. So again, it's self-identify. This means that they can opt out of it if they want to, um, just kind of for your internal tracking purposes, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, and I and I'll just add too. I, you know, Leah, you're right. You're not going to have pre-employment inquiries for students, but um, there is a similar concept around uh, applications for admission, uh, right? So, in the student context, you can't ask a student in in an application for admission um, the the same type of question around marital status. Uh, and so, I would say, you know, these same types of uh, uh, good pieces of advice here, miss or misses, those kinds of things, also should not appear in an application for students for admission to the institution. Yeah, absolutely. I think your safest bet here is just to remove all of that from all of your um, anything that you have where people fill it out. Just don't ask them and that'll be the safest bet for you. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I, like I said, this is our shortest session, but a lot of really good information and really appreciate all the time and effort put into highlighting this important topic. As always, if you've been watching the other sessions, I'd like to just hit a few points on the way out for you. The first is that the Office of Civil Rights has made resources available. Certainly, if you are a Title IX coordinator or someone else on campus with significant responsibility for administering this new rule and generally uh, uh, Title IX requirements, you are going to want to pay attention to these resources. The first three bullets you see on your screen, the fact sheet, the summary of key provisions, resources for drafting policies are all documents that uh, OCR has made available that specifically talk about the new rule. The final bullet here is uh, a, a link to the OCR policy guidance portal. So it's got some of these materials on it, but we also anticipate that it will be a place that you can track and locate additional guidance as it is uh, coming out over the, the months and years to come. So please make sure, put these on your browser, your favorites, whatever browser you use, whatever it's called, a bookmark, you name it. Um, but I, we would check all of these things uh, and in addition, in particular, make sure you've got a link to that portal. We'll also note, uh, we have a number of resources available. Would love for you to check these resources out. The first and most important thing is we have a higher education resources page where all of the stuff that we create uh, for institutions of higher education is in one place. And you can see if you scan the QR code that's right here on your screen, uh, it will take you to that higher education resources page. You can also put in Thompson Coburn slash higher ed, and it goes to our main page, and the resources link is there as well. But please check it out. This is where you'll find the materials for this Title IX training series. Uh, that's both the links to the videos and to the uh, uh, slides themselves with the with the hyperlinks. You'll also find to the extent uh, it, when we release the best practices videos, those links will be there. And there are a number of other things too. We've got all our webinars and training series. Uh, we cover a lot of ground with our webinars for higher education, um, not just Title IX, but a lot of things around the federal financial aid programs, the new financial value transparency, gainful employment rule, financial responsibility reporting, incentive compensation, mergers and acquisitions, you name it, it's there. Um, we create a number of white papers every year uh, that we post on this page. And so they're sort of uh, usually desk guides tools that we try to make available that we think will be useful to institutions. One of the ones that we did last year that's been uh, particularly helpful, we think, uh, as we have been told, is the uh, desk guide we did for financial value transparency and gainful employment. Also, Scott Goldschmidt and I uh, work pretty hard on a new updated version of the Financial Responsibility Reporting Guide, which you see here on your screen, and that was released earlier this year. Um, and then we have our blog, Leah, Stephanie, Scott, uh, we're all writing blogs all the time uh, as our other members of the higher education team. Uh, and also we tend to post on our blog when we've got new videos and other materials. So we'd love for you to sign up for that. Um, the last note I'll just make, here's our disclaimer, and it simply says, uh, we're not your attorneys, unless it so happens that we are your attorneys, and if we're not, we'd love to be. Give us a call. Uh, and please keep in mind that this is not legal advice. It is for informational purposes only. Thank you so much for listening in. Again, if you've made it through all four sessions, congratulations. Hope you'll keep an eye out for those best practices videos as well. And as we always say, and most importantly, um, until next time, be well.